We lived in a normal little house that sat at the end of a normal little street in a normal little suburban town. However, the things that occurred inside this house were anything but that. This came about after my wife and I's decision to have a child. To understand the strangeness of this child, you have to go back to the story of his birth. He was our fifth attempt, following four practically stillborn predecessors. I say the children were practically stillborn, because they weren't quite dead when they were born, although it would be difficult to even call them children at all. They had these bizarre cartoonish features, like enormous ears and sunken in eyes, and generally did not live very long. Then finally on our fifth try, my wife gave birth to a beautiful baby boy, who we adoringly referred to as Petey. And for a short time at least, we loved him. Sadly though, he did not love us back. As I said before, he was a strange baby. It was like he didn't understand normal human interaction. The only things that he responded to were when we would make big over-the-top gestures or, strangely, when one of us would get hurt. I remember the first time I realized there was something wrong with him was when my wife cut her finger with a kitchen knife and began to bleed profusely. When I scrambled over to put pressure on it and calm her down, I looked over at Petey and noticed that he couldn't stop giggling and cooing while his mother stood there screaming. No normal baby would do that, ever. As he grew up, his interests became more and more unusual and aggressive. I was a cartoonist by trade and always have kept my character sketches framed and up on the wall throughout our house. But when Petey was still at a very young age, they started disappearing. One day, after an extensive search of the house, we found several of them in his room under the bed, with food and red crayons smeared across the original's faces. Petey was a very quiet kid. He maybe only said one word every couple weeks. But when we sat him down to talk about that, he abruptly yelled, I can't help myself! In this bizarre, cartoonish tone. The kid was dangerously addicted to cartoons of all kinds. On a normal day, he would watch them all day long, with the only way to stop him being physically covering his eyes and prying him away from the TV. However, once we started making him go to school, the real chaos began. Every single day, he would be sent home for either screaming in students' ears or biting or scratching them. We tried a special school after that and sent him to numerous psychiatrists, but nothing seemed to help. There was no controlling this kid, so we were given no choice but to start homeschooling him. That was when we started finding the dead animals around the house. At first it was just lizards and frogs, but then it progressed to mice, birds, and even cats. And they weren't just dead either. They would be strangely mutilated, with the heads of some of them attached to the bodies of others, using glue and duct tape. His psychiatrist diagnosed him as schizophrenic, due to the fact that he claimed to always have background music following him around. To be honest, it was tough to just write him off as crazy though. Especially when we found the mutilated dog. Its eyes were bulging out and bones arranged in a way that made it appear like he was standing up on two legs. We knew we had to make a stand at this point, so we came up with a plan. I know it's cruel, but we needed him out of our lives and felt like there was no other option. So we thought of somewhere far, far away that we could bring him, and we knew if we left him there, it was likely he would never find his way back to us especially with his limited interpersonal skills. But it had to be a place that he would actually go to, because there was very little point trying to force him to do anything he didn't want to do. 
That was okay, though. We had the perfect spot. It was a world filled with cartoon characters, and it was on the opposite end of the country. That place was called Walt Disney World. When we told Petey about the idea to go on a family trip there, he put his finger over his mouth and moved it up and down rapidly. Then he started jumping around like a maniac. We assumed this meant he was okay with it. Therefore, the trap was set. The drive down was long and hard, but we couldn't fly there because there would be a trace of the plane ticket. When we finally got there, we purchased our tickets with cash, and we came across a photo op with Goofy and some other characters. Trying to keep Petey sane before we got in the park, we decided to take a photo with them. Not sure whatever happened to that. I held his hand as we walked him through the front gates of Magic Kingdom. As soon as we got in there, he saw Mickey Mouse walk by, bit my hand, and chased after him. That was our cue to go. We got back on the monorail and left the park, and Petey was none the wiser. Although we lived in Oregon, we definitely expected to hear something about Petey on the news in the coming months. Oddly, that was not the case. We even searched the news from the surrounding area and still saw nothing. That was the last thing we expected to happen. It was like he just vanished without a trace. However, there was always this wandering suspicion that our cruel deed would someday come back to bite us. And that suspicion proved correct. A couple years ago, we heard a story from one of the park's employees about a mysterious man who has kidnapped many children around the park. He's said to have a mutilated body that's been misshapen to look like a cartoon character. Once we heard that, we realized the plague we had set upon the world. All the misery and pain that has taken place down there is completely our fault. Perhaps once someone finds this letter, they'll understand how truly sorry we are for what we've done. Hopefully in the forgiving arms of the Lord, we may find peace from the monster we created, even though in this world, we could not.